The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alta Patel. I'm a director of scientific improvement at Nelson Laboratories. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about reprocessing validations regarding flexible endoscopes and some updates about Amy SD91 that may affect uh, you as a user end and also as a manufacturer for these validations. As we know that Amy SD91 is a healthcare document on reprocessing reusable, flexible, and semi rigid endoscopes. Although this document is geared towards healthcare practices, there are many things in this document that could relate to manufacturers' responsibilities as well. This includes IFU, training, future considerations re regarding how to make these devices ready for patients. And this is what the majority of my talk is going to go, uh, is going to be about today. As a validation specialist, I work with manufacturers to validate these devices every day. And with this updated document, I can help bring out some highlights and some things that manufacturers should consider during their validation and operation of these devices to deliver devices that are ready for patient. Some of the objectives that I will be talking about in this webinar today will be discussing important changes in Amy SD91 that may impact the way how validation should be conducted and what manufacturers have to think about when they are designing these validation plans. What is the responsibilities for manufacturers? How are they going to help uh, provide healthcare practices to the user end? And how does this standard affect manufacturers that make flexible and semi-rigid endoscopes? What is their responsibility in this standard? Yes, it's a healthcare document, but how are you playing a role in there? And what is the hold for the future? What are the manufacturers going to be thinking about in the future now that this document is out and published? Now, as we all know, um, Amy SD91, um, the previous version was 2015, and it did take seven years to complete this document. And you might you might say, why did it take seven years? And what were you talking about in those seven years to get this uh, document updated and published? Now, to give you a debrief, this document had about 150 people in the committee. And majority of the committee members were hospital staff that represented user perspective and manufacturers of AERs and flexible endoscopes. We had a few organizations and regulations that did sit on the table, such as AORN, SGNA, ISHIM, testing labs like us, and joint commissions and independent representation. However, when you put all of us together, there was, there was a lot of mixed discussions and, and representations on what needs to be implemented in this new version. And how are we going to go about implementing all the new content to current version that what was previously required? And how are the healthcare facilities going to come to par with the updated 2022 standard? And, and what are we going to do with the standard and how are we going to implement it? So we have to give some time for healthcare to get into the space to make sure that they are updated with the current standards. And that is some of the things that I'm going to be talking about as we move along. Now, just to give you a debrief, this guidance, um, sorry, this standard is, is a guidance for reprocessing flexible endoscopes and semi-rigid endoscopes. It does exclude TEE probes um, and rigid endoscopes and dilators. There is a new TIR being put together currently for these very devices, as we know that they are as important as the flexible endoscopes as well. But we do want to put it all in one standard and divide them into two parts. So the standard um, that we're going to talk about today is solely focused on flexible endoscopes and semi-rigid endoscopes. The TE ultrasound probes, the manometer, the rigid endoscopes, those will be um, in another guidance document, which is going to be a TIR. It's TIR 99. They're working on it right now, and you should be able to see that shortly. Some of the highlights that um, we're going to be talking about is the guidance is addressing all steps of processing. So the new version of the document covers the entire processing step that's required to reprocess a flexible endoscope. 
from point of use treatment to how to transport the scopes, what is required in transportation? What kind of bins do you use? Do you need a biohazard sticker? How are you gonna label it? Leak testing, what kind of leak testing are we looking at? Cleaning, uh, what are we still doing manual cleaning? Are we still doing ARs? How does AR play a role in cleaning? High level disinfection, are we, are we recommending high level disinfection or sterilization? What are the options here for scopes? drying and quality control. So these are the things that I'm going to go through each um, each of my slides when I when I go through the presentation. Now the first thing I want to focus on is training. Training was a big discussion and what it came down to is whose responsibility is it really? Is it the healthcare facility or is it manufacturers? And there was a huge debate when we were putting this document together. Um, who does this, this responsibility go to? And it is, it, is, it is both. Both parties are responsible. And um, it is written in the standard that training and competency verification requirements, all personnel shall, as you know, the word shall means you have to, complete formal training and competency verification prior to performing endoscopic processing. So now you have to have a documentation that you have performed, you have done the formal training. Who's giving this formal training? Is it the manufacturers or is it the nurses or is it the infection preventionist? I know that the manufacturers in certain part are responsible for the training aspect and providing the training for these reusable devices. So one thing that manufacturers have to understand is they will be asking you for training content. So you should prepare and be ready that when healthcare facilities ask for that, that you are ready to provide that information. Now it's not only SC91 that is focusing or, or um, going for some sort of training formal training verification. Um, ISO 17664, FDA guidance document, the MDRs also are alluding to that you want to make sure that there is some sort of competency built in or verification built in that shows that the person that's reprocessing these flexible endoscopes have some sort of training. And the training is given not only by by the um, infection preventionists, the nurses, or the department in healthcare that does provide that training. But manufacturers are some, some part responsible and have provided the content for the training. So something that I, I would um, focus on as a manufacturer is, do, you, do I have these training documents that I can provide to the healthcare facility? Because they will be asking for that information. Now, on my last bullet point, you will see that all personnel performing processing of endoscopes should be certified in a flexible endoscope processing within two years of employment. So they do give you leeway, but you definitely want to ensure that in two years, they, they do have a certification when they're testing these scopes. So it's just not competency and formal training, a certification is also required, but they give you time for that certification. In the essence, it's like uh, performing human factors testing that, man, that, that you as manufacturers are, are used to performing. You wanna make sure that the IFU you have written is well understood and can be followed as written. The same thing, same thing, same training and same, same verification requirements is that you're ensuring that your IFU is easily readable can be followed without any problems, and, and all the components that are part of the endoscope reprocessing are well understood and identified. Now, one of the things that um, I wanna go over is end of life testing. Something that all manufacturers are aware of and are learning day by day that this is something that is um, a recommended request or a requirement from these, the, um, the governing bodies. Now, ISO and the FDA guidance document do give MDMs some kind of leeway saying that the MDM must determine if reprocessing leads to degree of degradation that will limit the useful life. So you have to provide some sort of evidence or some sort of data that shows that uh, when can the users can no longer use this device. And how do you gather that data? You have to do some sort of a verification test. 
And so they are alluding to testing, but they're not saying you have to test it till end of life. You, you, you can extrapolate some information from the verification tests that are performed. Now, one thing I want to bring to your attention is when you look at ISO 10993-1, section 4.8, it says for reusable medical devices, biological safety shell, again, this word shell, right? That means you have to be evaluated for the maximum number of validated processing cycles by the manufacturer. So when I read this, I see, I read that you have to have this data and you have to provide some sort of biological safety factor either by evaluating the chemicals that are being used on these scopes, which from hospital to hospital, they're different. So you have to figure out your high level disinfectant that's going to be used on these scopes. So something that uh, we're seeing MDR and uh, notified bodies asking for. So keep that in mind that it might be something that you may have to support and want to start thinking about it. One of the areas that the guidance document spent a lot of time on updating was processing area. Current standards don't allow um, spaces between the different phases of reprocessing. You have cleaning, you have disinfection, and you have hanging the scopes for drying in the same room. This is no longer going to happen. And this document exemplifies what a reprocessing room should look like and how they should be separated depending on what processes are happening. You, They do recommend a three sink, like the picture I have here. This is a part of our lab. They have the three sinks for validation. That is what they're looking for. And um, asking med hospitals or healthcare facilities to update that and not just provide one sink. They want a unidirectional flow. Very important to have that, where you have contaminated scopes come from point of use cleaning, that's at bedside. Then there is your cleaning. Then there is a nice separation between the cleaning and the disinfection. You don't have your sink and your AR right next to each other because that's cleaning, pre-cleaning, and then you're putting it right straight in, in the AR for disinfection. Then you're removing right in the cleaning area that is disinfectant is ready for patient use basically. So very important to understand that these, these different um, areas are segregated and separated and scopes that are hung to dry for use shall not be placed in the same room that they're being reprocessed. They have to be in a separate room. Why I'm bringing this up for manufacturers is when you go to the healthcare facility you want to make sure that they are designed in that manner. Because if anything happens to the scope and it is linked to that it wasn't reprocessed properly, they're not looking at manu they're not looking at healthcare facilities. They're looking at manufacturers. As you all know, that if something happens, it's the manufacturers that are going to be answering to that question. So you so you want to make sure that if you are if you're selling a product to the healthcare facility, they have a design flow that is updated to the current AMI SD91 standard, right? And you also want to ensure that the IFU has an outline that has this flow. You don't want uh, your IFU jumbled up. You want to make sure that it is point of use cleaning, which we call bedside for, for flexible endoscopes, to cleaning, to disinfection, and then to storage. That is how it should be outlined in the IFU. And that is exactly how they would be following the procedure and following the IFU. So you, so this is a two part. You wanna ensure that your instructions for use accounts for it. And also you wanna make sure the healthcare facility has this flow. Now point of use treatment, we all talk about it. Um, it was updated, it was formerly known as pre-cleaning. So you wanna make sure that your IFUs are updated to the terminology that the standard has now. Now we use the term point of use treatment instead of pre-cleaning. Manufacturers are also 
in, in known that uh, point of use treatment must occur immediately after use, which we see in bedside cleaning and how we should be disconnected. There's a lot of information in the point of use cleaning on how to do this process in the clinical site. As you can see here, um, it may include often steps described below are typically omitted during validation. So when you're thinking about validations, point of use treatment is a step that we either remove completely or modify it to add certain steps in it, add uh, less flushes in it, um, remove certain portions that are typical in the bedside cleaning. So now we're evaluating stuff that might happen in healthcare facility that the that might not happen. You want to try to ensure that things like that are included in your validation when we're doing the validations for flexible endoscopes. Water quality. This was a very, very hot topic when we were evaluating the standard. Water quality, you have to monitor and control water quality for manual reprocessing and ARs. You want to make sure that the water that's getting into the AR is critical water when it's when we're doing HLD and final, re, final rinses. And the filter that's used for that is definitely performing to its expectations. And when do you change those filters? And how do you change them? Um, those are the things that manufacturers have to provide information on, right? So that is your responsibility here that they are going to be looking for. And also on the testing, manufacturers should provide training on how to obtain water from AR. Right, what port are they gonna pull the water from? And how are they measuring it? Manu manufacturers should provide training on when filters need to be changed. Like I talked to just right now, filters are number one problems for contaminated water getting in the ARs. A lot of the times when we were talking in, in the committee, the users were like, we don't know when to change it. We just see brown or black and we then assume that, yeah, this is now time to change it. Water quality, feed water that comes in from the municipal are at different grades and different states. So when you test your filters, you wanna test it to a point where you're, you're looking at the most highly content of ionic molecules in it. So you can understand at what point are your filters expired. And you, sometimes it's not only expiration day you have to worry about, you have to worry about when does it start to clog, give examples so healthcare facilities know when to take care of it. Because it is not when it's um, healthcare facilities problem if the filter is clogged and it's providing bad water. So that is going to be the AR's responsibility at that point. So you want to make sure that that kind of training is well documented and given. Periodic tests should be performed. It does, it does specify that for AERs, for microbial assessment of AER due to cross-contamination from scopes. So they are asking um, healthcare facilities to do this. Now, they don't know how to do this, so manufacturers have to come up with a plan to help them coach and how to collect and how to test. And what is the periodic every three months, every six months? What is the timeline here or the span that you're going to be performing these? And how are they monitored? What is the, um, what is the alert? What is the action level? Things like that you may wanna consider um, when discussing water quality for ARs and, and also water quality for manual processes. You wanna make sure that when you're using utility water for your, for your cleaning, it's somewhat processed utility water. You're not, you're not testing it where it's hard water because hard water makes detergents inefficient and then the detergent doesn't work at all because it's interfering with the enzymes in it. So this topic is very, very important and not, not only for users, but also for, for manufacturers to understand that the water quality used to clean your scopes and reprocess is as important as the entire processing step because water plays a huge role in deterioration of devices, cleaning ineffic efficacy, and 
destroying your products and ARs, right? So you want to make sure that the water that they're using is the correct form. Leak testing was another one. A um, lot of confusion on leak testing, but um, endoscopes that can be leak tested should, should not be used. They're pushing this. It doesn't say shell, it says should, but they are pushing it. If, you, if your scopes cannot be leak tested, nobody's going to use them. So you want to make sure that if you're manufacturing a flexible endoscope, it can be leak tested. Automated leak, leak tester should be placed on calibration schedule. So now when you have an automated leak tester, who's calibrating that? You provided it, but who's calibrating that? So you have to think about um, a, rut a routine where you would go and make sure that the machine that you have given for leak testing is still working. Manufacturers should provide training on how to leak test the endoscope for assurance. They should also provide training on how to calibrate the leak tester if provided for endoscope. If you are not available, they should be able to calibrate on their own. And so it doesn't just stop right there, right? Um, manufacturers should provide training regarding pressure damages to, en to endoscopes. What happens when you are using the wrong pressure and you've busted one of the channels? right how how are we do what happens there so you they need to understand why pressure is important and how to pressurize the scopes so you're not damaging them if you don't give training on this things can go wrong very fast so it's very important that when manufacturers are providing leak testers or they come to know that they're using a commercial leak tester on your scope you assess that factor and understand how those are put together Updates of IFE to increase wet leak testing time to 60 minutes. Um, wet leak testing time period changed from 30 seconds to 60 seconds. And so that's going to be a change in IFU that manufacturers have to start putting in, right? No more 30 seconds. They have to visualize for 60 seconds. High risk endoscopes. I'm sure you all have heard about that. What is a high risk endoscope? You know, if you look at the definition that they've provided in the standard, it says endoscopes that have been associated with infectious outbreaks, including those that are difficult to process and, in, and increase the risk of incomplete clearance of contaminating infections organisms, including bronchoscopes, cystoscopes, duodenoscopes, ultrasound endoscopes, ureteroscopes. These are all scopes that are on the list of high risk endoscopes, right? I don't have it in here, but gastroscopes and colonoscopes are also among those scopes that are defined as high risk endoscopes. Now, when you define something as a high risk endoscope, they shall be monitored with cleaning verification after each cleaning, okay? So this is something that you may want to know as a manufacturer that all of these scopes that are defined as high risk endoscopes will be monitored with a cleaning verification after each cleaning. This is a burden to the healthcare facility, but it is a benefit to the manufacturer, right? You wanna make sure that these scopes are clean before it's used on patients. And now for these type of scopes, they are requiring it. There's also a scheduled monitoring program where you just pull scopes at a diff randomly and you would wanna test for them and um, Annex F of this document gives some sort of a schedule that it's just an example schedule that's given to uh, to healthcare facilities so they understand how they should be monitoring. But this is something a visibility for manufacturers to know that this is going to be happening, and you may see more of refurbishments and more repairs now that this is a requirement. And one thing to remember is with high risk endoscopes, manufacturers should validate all flexible endoscope for reprocessing and must validate all high-risk endoscopes. High-risk endoscopes will no longer be justified. You can't put them under an umbrella and say that that is, um, it goes under a gastroscope because uh, this, this, is, this bronchoscope is less invasive. Now, there may be some uh, leeway here or there, but the idea here is all high-risk endoscopes will be subjected to validation.
all endpoints, protein, TOC, hemoglobin for validations are tested through a fully quantitative analytical methods. ATP is not appropriate for validations, right? You, we use ATP for healthcare checks, those verification, cleaning verification tests. They're going to be using ATP. For validations, we don't use ATP. We're not, we're not verifying or validating the cleaning efficacy. And so we have to use fully quantifiable assays for that. Manual disinfection is something that is not recommended. And it says it very clearly in the standard. And they tell you why they don't want manual disinfections, right? So manufacturers should start thinking about alternate methods for their flexible endoscopes if this is the only method available. Thankfully, a lot of uh, manufacturers that make these flexible endoscopes do have the, the, more, the idea of validating in, in automated methods. So that is the process that you want to do. Also, transitioning from HLD to sterilization as a, as a standard care is an accelerated pace. So it's, a why, it's wise to, do, to design flexible endoscopes used for semi-critical procedures to withstand low temperature sterilization. Eventually, we are going to move towards sterilization, right? Um, during this debate, we didn't do it because it was the, the industry is not ready for sterilization, right? You know that, we know that. So high level disinfection is still gonna happen. But for future, you wanna start designing your flexible endoscopes that will withstand sterilization because that's where we're headed. Visual inspection, very important for drying as well. Visual inspection, FDA recommends to use lighted magnification, 5X, 10X for duodenoscopes. That's a requirement. They're gonna be start looking very carefully in for duodenoscopes. Um, boroscopes are highly recommended and a lot of healthcare facilities are starting to buy these boroscopes and are using it as their quality process as well. Drying, um, never store scopes wet because that causes microbial um, growth. And it is required now that dry channels, sorry, not required, but recommended to dry channels for at least 10 minutes with instrument air with HEPA filtered air. Um, IFU may need to be updated for manufacturers that already have stuff out there. They are going to be enforcing the 10 minute and joint commissions were right on this game. They, they want to see that these scopes are being dried for 10 minutes per channel right? You, not just the intimate instruction channel, but all the channels. And then you want to dry the external surfaces. Now, boroscope inspections. Um, I have this slide up here because a lot of manufacturers are like, well, hospitals are not using it. So why do we want to do that for our validation? You probably want to bring it into the validation perspective to make, to ensure that when we're doing worst case testing on, on these scopes, that the inspection that we're doing with the boroscope shows that uh, your scope is clean and doesn't have any debris left on there. Very important to know and formulate as well. So that's why I have this as, a, as just a reminder for manufacturers to start including boroscope inspections as part of their validation because healthcare facilities are in a strong movement to start bringing these boroscopes into their facilities to start inspecting their scopes. These are some of the things that the um, standard outlines for boroscope inspections. Why do them, right? This is stuff that we can't see with our naked eye or with any lighted magnification. So we need something that goes in there to take a look at it. And believe it or not, some of these are from our lab, right? We, we've seen this. And so these are pictures from there. And some are in the standard, right? So SD91 has a whole annex on why to do boroscope inspections and what do you find in there that um, can cause patient safety? So important to think about. Now for drying, of course, and endoscope should never store wet. We all know that. And you wanna make sure that when you're inspecting the hospitals that they do have a cabinet that will help facilitate drying. There is a lot out there and uh, you sh they should have one. And the importance of drying is, <clears throat> I have it here, you know, the waterborne organisms will, will grow in it. 
and Pseudomonas originosa is one of the organisms that will grow. And yeah, it does cause infections. So you want to make sure that uh, number one, they're not stored wet. Number two, that they have a process to dry them. And with ST91 recommending 10 minutes with instrument air, that that is there, that that, that is there. And you want to make sure that your IFU also specifies that. These are some of the pictures for devices that are not dry, right, inside. And there are drying verification tests that healthcare facilities are doing. And also labs can do that. We don't do that currently for manufacturers, for validations. Uh, there is no established acceptance criteria. So, you know, it's omitted. However, they are means to do these validations and uh, we can help with the dry time verification tests. They have added a huge amount of up appendices and you will see several new appendices that are updated, right? Uh, purchasing of ARs, repairs is a big one. Uh, manufacturers IFE conflict, visual inspection has been added, the pictures I just showed you. Cleaning verification tests, what they are, how to do them. Safety considerations endoscope storage and risk assessment and endoscope drying. And this is some of the pictures I took from, from the standard just to um, give you an idea of what we're looking at when it comes to repairs. A big topic that was discussed, uh, who, who is doing the repairs and how are they performing it? And are they to the expectations that uh, the OEM has for them as well? So further reading will give you guidances on how to go about doing that. This takes me uh, to the end of my presentation, but uh, I just wanted to bring this slide up where we, as in Sotera Health Academy, uh, has this program that provides educational contact between Nelson, Sterogenics, Nordion, and Regula Regulatory Compliance Association, a Nelson Labs company for customers to learn more about these topics that I talked about today and many other topics regarding biocompatibility, packaging, um, ENL. There's tons of content that uh, can help manufacturers learn more about the topics that are current in the industry and how are we evaluating those. Now, Nelson Labs is under the Soterra Health along with our sister companies, Sterogenics and Nordion. So just to give you an outline of who Nelson Labs is and how we, we form under an umbrella of Sotera Health. Now, if you have been, this takes me to my slide where we have uh, my information. And if there is any questions or concerns or would want to learn more about this topic, please contact me and I'll be happy to go over anything you have. Thank you.